Hey Jenny, Darren here, and uh, I um, love this question that you have brought up in uh, your email regarding your salvation card, which I think your card is masterful, by the way. I think it's a brilliant, brilliantly done card. I, uh, I am glad that you're looking at that point uh, regarding uh, because God's holy, he can't be around sin. Uh, that's a really common thought in Christianity. I've heard it all my life growing up. But it's uh, kind of an interesting thing how actually easy it is to refute that. Uh, for one of them, um, Jesus is God, and he became a man and dwelt among us. So God was hanging around all of the stuff. He's fully God, and he's fully man, and he hung around sin. Not only did he hang around sin, he did some things that would have been viewed as sinful. For example, allowing a prostitute to wash you with her hair would have been regarded as sinful, and everybody uh, in that room, in fact, did view it as unbelievable that he would allow that. Secondly, he goes to the Samaritan woman at the well. The fact that he would even have a conversation with her, let alone receive the water that she would uh, draw from the well, is uh, really incredible. That would have been viewed as sinful in the minds of all of those people. So not only was he in their presence, he would receive from sinners. And uh, so that's an interesting point. Uh, in uh, Job, it says that Satan came into the presence of God, as he regularly did, apparently. And he said, have you seen Job? And so, once again, Satan himself is in the presence of God. And there's actually quite a few instances where we can see that God uh, is not in any way threatened by our sin. And um, in fact, I, I don't think that it would be right to say that holiness would be in sense an inhibitor to God. So he's holy, absolutely he is holy, but that does not inhibit him. And uh, so, um, you know, the whole thought, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And, not, and that concept of giving doesn't just referring to the sacrifice on the cross. It's him giving his son to the earth, the incarnation concept there. So I'd like to just really quick look with you at this whole salvation concept. And I think that uh, we frankly get it wrong uh, a lot in the church. So let's go to what is the essential elements of this conversation. Uh, I, I love John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. So belief is the key, obviously. We know it is for it is by grace you are saved through faith. Faith is the noun form of the verb believe, right? So as we express faith, then grace is released and uh, we are transformed. Uh, Paul says that I preach a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Galatians 6, 9, he says, without faith, it is impossible to please, or excuse me, this is Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And then Paul says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Okay. Now, um, one of the things I think is important to understand in this whole conversation is that we are the bride of Christ. Okay, we are going to the chapel and we're going to get married. <laughs> we're getting married to Jesus and we are his bride. And so I think if we miss the fundamental element of this relationship, uh, we will not understand it at all. And that is that it is a marriage. It's a love relationship between Jesus and his bride. And when you understand that this is all about two people coming together in love relationship, one person being Jesus, the other person being his bride, then I think this will make perfect sense. What is the essential element of a love relationship? Well, the essential element of a love relationship is faith, okay? And so when in, in you and your husband have a love relationship, and you believe in your husband, and your husband believes in you. My wife and I have been married for 35 years, next weekend, and uh, we believe in each other. 
I believe in Tammy and Tammy believes in me. And the result of that is not just a factual existence. Of course, we believe uh, in, that we exist, but the demons believe that Jesus exists, right? So that's not the kind of faith we're talking about. We're talking about a relational faith, uh, a belief in. I believe in my wife and my wife believes in me. It's a confidence in the other. It's a belief that they have your best interest at heart. And so then you trust them. And when you trust them, you allow them to work in your life. That is the essential element of salvation. When we believe in Jesus, for it is by grace you are saved through faith, then what happens when we believe in him, we're, there's an opening, there's a surrender there. And then he is able to impart to us and transform us with his grace. So this grace isn't just him forgiving us, it's a transforming work where we become new creations, okay? So I believe that understanding the love relationship is helps us understand the most fundamental element of that love relationship, which is faith. We believe in Jesus. This is an extremely biblical concept. Okay, so then where does sin play into this whole thing? And, and I uh, have heard this a thousand times over my life, that God cannot be in the presence of sin and that sin uh, has angered God. And now God has come to punish us and, or punish these things and that Jesus was punished for us and all that sort of stuff. I uh, don't actually believe that. I believe that what's really going on here is that God loves you, God loves me, and God loves the most broken person on the planet. And uh, I love what the scripture says in, in uh, uh, 1 John 2, 2, that he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Why is he atoning for these sacrifices, these sins? What is it that he's really doing there? Is he calming himself down? Is he in a fit of anger? Is he about ready to squash us because he's so angry that we went out and we got drunk? Is he so angry that we had an affair? Is he so angry that we lied? Is he so angry that we're jealous? Is that what's really going on? Or is there something else going on? And I think that there's something else going on significantly. And this is a transformative scripture for me. And this is Colossians 1.21. It says, once you were alienated from God. Now, God was not alienated from you. You were alienated from God. This is Colossians 121. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Okay? Now, here is that scripture right there says more about the role of sin than about anything else that I can think of. And, and so here's what happens. I uh, uh, decide to sin. You know, I'm tempted or I'm, I'm, I'm in a moment of weakness or I just, just committed to go out and do something nasty, okay? And so I go out and I do that. Here's what happens. I get a feeling in my gut that God's mad at me. Now, is God mad at me? Well, here's the truth. No, he's not. He's not mad at you because he is satisfied with the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. In fact, he no longer looks at me in my sin. He looks at me through the blood of Jesus. So his view of me doesn't even change one iota because of the work of Jesus on the cross. Okay? But that's not the problem. The problem isn't God's view of me. The problem is my view of God. I stop trusting him. Why? Because our relationship has become broken. Here's, uh, here's an example, okay? You sent me, uh, you sent, made a phone call to me. You wanted to talk to me about your brother, your future brother-in-law. And uh, uh, he's uh, going to be uh, uh, married to, to uh, Ariana and uh, uh, obviously a super cool guy. And you want to talk to him about the potential of being an evangelist with me. And by the way, I really want to talk to you about that. And I'm very excited to. But you called me last week, I think on the 15th. I think I was flying that day. I'm not sure. But it was several days ago. And I still haven't gotten you called back. I did just try to leave a message, by the way. But so here I am. And I'm thinking, man, Jenny loves us. Jenny works so hard for us. And I haven't even gotten back to Jenny yet. This is not cool. Now... Let me tell you what I know about Jenny on a very intellectual level. You're an awesome person, and you've already forgiven me for my transgression. But can I tell you what? 
there's a certain part of me that has become alienated from Jenny in my mind because of my evil behavior, okay? By my negligence of getting back to you, I'm feeling bad about that, and I've become an enemy in my mind towards you. That's what sin does. Now, if this continues and I don't get it resolved through repentance and call up Jenny and say, hey, Jenny, I'm really sorry. I need to tell you, I, I just been busy and I've been chasing a bunch of stuff and I was launching Jack and blah, 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 blah. And I'm so sorry that I, you know, did that. And I want you to know I care about you and you're meaningful to me and I don't want to be ignoring your phone call. Boom. Now, did that take away Jenny's wrath towards me? I don't think you ever really had wrath towards me. I think you're a big person and you're very understanding. But what it did was it took away my feeling of alienation. I know that now our relationship is in good standing. Okay. The problem with this scripture is, excuse me, I need to go back to that scripture. Alienated, excuse me. This is Colossians 1.21. Alienated. I'm sorry, it says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies, where? In your minds, not in God's mind, not in any other sense, but in our minds because of our evil behavior. Once we become alienated, we enter into the state, which is called unbelief. So if belief is the confidence that God is on your side and that he cares for you and that he wants to transform you, then unbelief would be the a lack of that confidence, the fear that he's not on your side. Okay, God didn't change in all this. We're the ones who changed. And that is the role of sin. So then the accuser of the brethren jumps in there. And he comes along and he's, at first he tempts us, say, hey, there's the thing you want to do. And we go, yeah, I do want to do that. And we go and we yield to that temptation. Then what does the accuser do? He comes back and he accuses us before God, day and night. And he accuses us. He says, look at you. Look at how you failed. You are no good. God is angry with you. You have lacked perfection. Now, that is the real problem. So the enemy's accusation uh, piles on to our own accusation, and this alienation becomes greater and greater and greater. Now, faith is not an on-off switch. It's more like a dimmer switch. And so it grows brighter or it grows dimmer. It can be extinguished, I'm convinced. And so what we want to do is we want to be living in such a manner that our faith is growing all of the time rather than diminishing. So back to this question. Can God hang around sin? Can God be around sin? Absolutely. Does sin even phase God? I don't even think it does at all. I don't think sin's honestly that big a deal to God in and of itself. The act of that person going and getting drunk, I don't think that really messes God up that much, to be honest with you. But here's what really messes him up, is that now, because that guy was out getting drunk, he doesn't feel like he can come to God. And so God's saying, you mean that I am no longer allowed to love you because of this? Okay, now I'm starting to get upset. Not upset at you. I'm upset that there is a breach in our relationship here. And that is the point, and that is the problem with sin. Sin doesn't change God, it changes us. And it makes it difficult for us to believe in Him, to trust and receive His grace, to have that love relationship that the bride and the groom are supposed to have in order to have a healthy, happy, growing relationship. So, um, what I would probably say, and, and try to get it concisely, is sometimes we do things that make us think God's angry with us. And God loves us, and he wants to set us free from those things so that we won't feel that way anymore. Now, that's too many words. We'd have to work on the wording to get it more concise. But that's the general concept of uh of, uh, that I am seeing very clearly in Scripture. And if you'd like to continue this discussion, I'd love to uh, go forward with, it, with you. This is a fascinating topic for me and a huge part of my own Christian experience and one of the real defining elements of my personal life and uh, kind of made me who I am, actually. And, uh, you know, I learned something a number of years ago. Every time I'd stand up in front of a church and preach that I was speaking to Jesus' bride, 
his bride that he loves. And I was pretty hard on the bride for a lot of years. And then one day I realized, oh my goodness, I should not speak to the bride that way because he loves the bride. He loves every man, woman, and child in this whole world. He bought the whole field. <laughs> he loves the whole field. But some of those, those vessels are hidden in the fields and they don't believe he loves them. They think they're trash. They think they're no good. There's, they, there's no way in heaven that God could love them. And it's so sad and it's so utterly untrue. So anyway, that's a little thought on that and love to get your feedback on that. Talk to you later.